Fantastic. I've gone too far already. So um, for those of you who were at Sunbelt, you will have seen this a version of this talk, um, which uh, I gave in 15 minutes. This is 30, so hopefully I'll be slower and clearer, and you'll actually understand what I'm talking about, hopefully. Um, so the, the, as I say, the title is Absent But Not Silent, The Causal Impact of Constraining Numbers of Contacts Elicited on Egocentric Networks. And as I'll highlight later, this is work jointly with colleagues at um, the, what is called Agincourt, the MRC Vitz Rural Public Health and Trans Health Transitions Research Unit at, at uh, Vitz University in South Africa and the Harvard Pop Center at, um, at Harvard. So uh, it, this is a very different talk, I think, from the last two in the sense that we're a little earlier in the data collection process, so we don't have quite much longitudinal data to look, show you. But I'm going to try and basically pull lemons, uh, lemonade from lemons in this case. I'm going to show you something that people highlighted as a problem and try and show you how I've tried to use this as a way to understand something about how people, uh, how people decide what they, uh, they're going to report in terms of network. So as this suggests, the core question we have here is that we know that social network elicitation is a, has a trade-off. The trade-off is basically we want to get as much information as we can, uh, but we want it to be the best information possible. And the more we ask for, the lower the average quality, uh, because people get tired, or because they forget things, etc. So, a common way to get around this in many, but not by any means all, social network work, is to use what we might call a fixed choice design, which is basically saying you can only name up to so many people. So we just focus you on your closest contacts in some by some, some definition. Um, and the big question, of course, is one of the big questions about that is then how does that limitation affect network composition? Who you have in your networks? I mean, there are many other questions we can ask too, but this is the one I'm going to focus on here. Um, and in a perfect world, we'd interview the same person twice um, uh, in a counterfactual fashion so they don't get to see the other answers first um, with and without those limits. So basically, name everyone you want and then name only up to say five, six, however many people, 10 people. Um, well, we can't easily get at that unless we do uh, a randomized case crossover study, um, I believe, which is not immediately available to a lot of us since we're not necessarily collecting data just to do these, these studies, but capturing this sort of information indirectly as we go along with other uh, studies, perhaps looking at health outcomes in my case. Um, but the repeated data collection on individuals is useful here because we know what we know various things. We know that the person is the same person each time, even though it's not a perfect comparison between the two rounds of, of connection. But the difficulty is that ego net composition is endogenous. And by that, I mean, it depends on you, right? Who you are. So the things that predict how many, how many uh, person, people you name in an unconstrained situation, so you can name as many people as you like, those kinds of things are also gonna predict who you name in your networks, what kind of person you are. And so if we want to get around that, we need to somehow stop people from being able to choose how many alters they get to name. But the downside of that is that then we don't get a comparison between a constrained and an unconstrained network. So what I'm going to try and persuade you of is that we have a situation where people's choices were constrained, but in a truly randomized fashion. So bear with me. Um, just to get you up to speed, the data collection for this work comes from a study called HALSI, or the Aging, Health, Health and Aging in Africa, a longitudinal study of the in-depth network community in South Africa. Um, the important thing for this is that it's a longitudinal cohort study. Um, we collected data in 2014-15, and then again in 2018-19, and we were supposed to be in the field sort of now-ish, but that's been pushed back, not surprisingly. Um, it's a random sample of adults age 40 plus, and they have to live in the Agincourt Health and Demographic Surveillance System site. Now, what is that? That is this. So the red dot on this map shows you where they are in the country as a, in the country of South Africa. So this is in the eastern side of South Africa. For those of you who may or may not have been to South Africa, if you went, you may well have gone to the Kruger National Park, which is a uh, national game park, animal uh, refuge, about the size of Wales, for those of you who know what the size of Wales is. Um, that red dot is just outside that part. So it's a very rural part of the country, um, but it's right next to a very, um, well, a, a, an area where you have a lot of tourism um, and 
but other than that, not a lot of jobs going on. So this is a, the Agincourt study site is a health and demographic surveillance site or system site. As I said, this is a, these are sites where we typically go and interview people on a regular basis. We build up censuses of the, of the population within a constrained geographic area. You can see here this red line outlines the 31 villages that fall within the Agincourt um, study site. And so the idea is we have a very good idea who's in that, in that area, who lives there, who's moved in, who's moved out. In many ways, it is very much a longitudinal survey process or census. So we can do a lot of longitudinal work on that. Um, historically, not a lot of longitudinal social network work. So in this study, we went to 27 of the 31 um, villages and we randomly sampled about half of the adults who were age eligible, so over the age of 40. Of those, we got 85% to participate at round one, and we managed to find 83% of those four years later. Of those 83%, I should say 94% of those who were still alive after four years were interviewed. So the retention rate's very high amongst those who survived. Amongst those who didn't, we have data on why they didn't, and there's a whole bunch of work on that as well. But you have a very well typified population essentially here, uh, and a reasonably strong follow-up on, on, on interviewing them across two rounds of uh, four years apart. The interviews were comprehensive. I know that Claire mentioned two to 11 hours of interviews. We didn't go that far, but the average interview in the first round, I think was about two, two and a half hours. And these are older populations as well. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of questions, but also some physical measurements and cognitive testing. Um, gonna focus today though, not surprisingly, on the social network module. And the social network module in both rounds was supposed to be asked in exactly the same way. Please tell me the names of six adults with whom you've been in communication in person or by phone or by internet in the past six months, starting with the person who's most important to you for any reason. You will notice this says six. So this is a fixed choice design with a fixed number of six. Um, and for those six people who you named, and we actually add in your spouse, if you didn't mention your spouse and they're alive, um, we ask you about interaction, so communication essentially, in person or not in person, um, various kinds of support you receive from them, and indeed conflict. We also ask about, for the authors, we ask about age, gender, relationship, where they live, and we ask about how strong the ties are between them. So we have sort of extended ego net in the sense that we, cap we capture, let me get this right, ego perceived alter alter ties. Now, I said you were meant to name six people. They didn't. So this is a figure from a paper I presented at Sunbelt a few years ago. Um, and if you draw a line across the six there, that should have been how many people named. Each dot here is um, one interviewer in one month. And the size of the dot is proportional to the number of interviews they did. Um, and what you can see, if you follow the colors along, it's hard to follow because they repeat the colors eventually. Uh, there are about 25 interviewers. You can see almost every single interviewer over time declines in the number of alters they elicit. Um, we can't prove it, but based on talking to people, to interviewers, and, and to field coordinators and things like that, we're pretty convinced that essentially the interviewers learned that they could shorten the interview, and this was a long interview, remember, they could shorten this module if they elicited fewer alters. So that's more or less what happened. You can see it fall, the average number of alters' names falls from about five and a half um, at the beginning of the interview process to about two, one and a half, two. By, 20, by September 2015. Uh, we retrained and the numbers went up a bit, as you can see in the last couple of months, but essentially uh, that's the process you've got. So what was I saying? I was saying that we want a situation where the respondent is constrained in the number of alters they name, um, but not in a way that they get to choose. So you could consider this to be the case here, where the interviewer is to some extent driving how many alters you get to name. That's sort of probably nudging rather than saying stop at three or stop at two, but rather you didn't really mean that many, did you? you didn't, that's all you've got, right? That's all you need to talk about. So analytically, based on this, we're going to try and focus on, as I say, ensuring that the change in ego net size between the first round and the second round is random. Well, in the first round, as we say, the mean interview a month ego net size, which is to say the mean number of alters named by each respondent of a given interviewer in a given month is gonna be used as an instrumental variable, and I'll come back to instrumental variables in a bit. But essentially, the, the interviewer, to some extent, constrained uh, and set the number of alters that they could name. 
And at wave two, we were very much firmer. The computer program required six names. There was no way out. So they had to name six people. Um, even if they hadn't talked to anyone, or even if they were totally isolated, they had to name people. And then when we came to elicit the interaction and the, the, the name interpreters, people could just say, I haven't talked to them this, this year, say. So it turns out, and we'll come back to, to what happens when you do that. There's a whole issue around um, whether that created could create problems in terms of forcing people to name names even when they haven't got anyone. Could that create mental, um, mental health issues? Uh, we're not aware of that, but it's certainly something to bear in mind. But the upshot of all this is that you have it, if you look at the difference between wave one and wave two, at neither wave did the respondent truly get to choose how many authors they named, but we see a difference in how they, and how many names were available. And what's more, we see that variation, as you can see, it's not a consistent, it's not like we went from a, a fixed number of three to a fixed number of six, we, we allow some variation. So as I say, we're gonna use that mean number of alters named for each interview a month as an instrumental variable, so, i.e. something that predicts your, the actual number of respondents, the you know, actual number of ego um, of alters you name, but does it, uh, but does it in a way that it cannot conceptually or we hope cannot conceptually be confounded, i.e. there's nothing else that drives that the number of um, alters that the interviewer allows you to provide. As you saw, there's variation by interviewer, so that's pretty much randomly assigned interviewer, and by month of interview. And the month of interview, more or less, is, is randomly assigned to the respondent as well. They don't get to choose which month they get interviewed in, more or less. Um, the only thing we know of that predicts that is which village you're in, because they, the, the interviewers went from village to village. So we can control for that. The upshot is that we have something that we will claim to be an instrumental variable um, of the, uh, to predict the number of alters you actually name in that first round, and therefore the difference between your first wave and your second wave number of alters named. Um, and so the first step in this regression model is essentially to say, you use that interview a month uh, value to predict the actual number of uh, alters you name. And then the second step you use the prediction value from that from that first step to, to look at some ego net properties. Um, and I'll, again, I'll try and unpack this and hopefully it'll become a little bit clearer. I'm still figuring out exactly how to explain this to people, I think. Um, that's just to highlight to you what you what I already showed you, which is the mean uh, number of alters named across waves vary or fell across time. And this is to show you something about descriptive data from the first, first and second wave. So the orange bars across the top, the, the complete, uh, the solid orange confidence intervals at the top show you how many people were named or how many contacts per month you had in the second wave. So this was one of these uh, questionnaires where you say, in terms of communication, we asked, did you talk to them every day, twice a, twice a week, or a few times a week, once a week, a few times a month, once a month, et cetera. And what I did was to flip that around and say, if you say you talk to someone every day, you get 30, contacts per month with that person. If you talk to them once a week, you get four contacts a month, et cetera. So it's a way of trying to sum up across all the different alters you named, a, sum, a, a summary measure of, of total contact. So you can see that the orange bars at the top are what happened in wave two, the gray bars at the bottom are what happened in wave one. So you can see a much more contact named at the second wave, and that's because we, as we, we expected, we get more actual alters named in the second wave. The blue one is my, my, my not particularly good attempt to um, to get to predict what would have happened if everyone had, had been able to give six answers. Um, I don't really trust that that's correct. So I focus on the fact that we have a lot more contacts in the second wave than the first wave. That's the key thing here. And this is just to show you the same thing over time. Uh, so if you were interviewed in November 2014 in the first wave, ignoring when you were interviewed in the second wave, you can see there's a, there's a, a change of about 30 more communication event, communication days, as I've called them, in the, between the first wave and the second wave. As you move to the right, and the constraint binds more strongly, i.e. The, the interviewers let you give fewer alters, that gap goes up, which is what you'd expect. This is descriptively true. Uh, our concern, as I say, is that this might be um, confounded in some way by the kinds of people who are giving the answers that they're giving. Um, this is just to show you that once you adjust for the number of alters you give, that difference goes way down. So people are not naming alters that are massively stronger, descriptively, uh, or masses more contact, but they are naming um, more alters. So this is maybe a slightly clearer descriptive statistics table to show you that in the first round, 
the average person named 3.3 alters. In the second round, they named 6.1. So that's six on that roster we had, and 10% of them hadn't named a spouse, so we added them in as well, um, a living spouse, I guess you could say. So you see almost a doubling in the number of alters named. You also see almost a doubling in the number of communication events named. You see substantially more than that in terms of uh, increase in emotional and financial support, not so much in terms of information and physical support, and a huge increase in conflict events in relative terms, but obviously in absolute terms, there wasn't a lot of conflict to start with, much, much less than anything else. Um, you can see it doesn't. It might lead to a slightly less dense network. But again, these are all descriptive. We'd like to get a bit beyond that and see if we can get at something um, that might actually, we might be able to trust to be reflecting truly the impact of the constraint rather than just the, the, the kinds of people we're talking to. So I'm going to try and lay out these. So what I did essentially, what we said, we said we did regression analysis. And so the regression analysis throws out um, some coefficients. I'm going to try and show you all the coefficients from I think it's 16 regressions in, um, in one table. I'm going to walk it through very slowly to start with. <laughs> so as you can, this is the all communication. This is, did you talk this per, how often did you talk to this person, either in person or by phone or internet or whatever you like? And what you can see here is that I'm saying that for every standard deviation of the, the constraint, so this is essentially the standard deviation of how many people you got to name, um, it, let me get this right. Sorry, sorry. For every extra person that you got to name in the in the first wave versus, so so yeah, for every extra contact you got to name in that first wave, what did it do to the change in the the level of communication change we're talking about here, uh, and standard deviations of change? So what it's saying essentially is that um, an extra contact in this case led to a lower level of by about 0.1 standard deviations, uh, a lower level of com communication with each contact. So. The more, I'm going to try and walk this through my head very clearly, the more constrained leads to less communication with each person, right? So the extra people you're going to name uh, has, in, in the second round, they, you have less communication with those new extra people. Similarly, you're getting, they, they, they were providing less physical and financial support than the, the people you named early on in the first round. Um, and but there are similar levels of emotional and informational support. Conflict seems to be somewhere in the middle. One thing I should flag here is that this is not a case of the people you're naming at wave one and wave two have changed. That's fine. We can control for that because we're controlling for the fact that everybody's networks change from wave one to wave two. We're saying what's the difference for in the in the networks for the people who had very constrained networks at the first stage? and less constrained networks at the first stage. So you got these people are giving, having less communication, the extra people we are naming, less financial and physical support. They tend to be more same gendered. So you're saying essentially these extra people we're adding tend to be more, are more likely to be same gender, the same gender as you. They're also more likely to be younger. Now bearing in mind these people were 40 at, the begin, at least 40 years old at the beginning and life expectancy in South Africa in this area is somewhere between 55 and 60. So there aren't so many of the older people who are more than 15 years older than you there. But you'll notice that it's not that the older people are falling off, um, again, uh, but it's the same age people. So you're getting, when you name extra people, they seem to be younger generation people versus, and, and less likely to be same generation people. But no difference in the chances they're older, which again, as I say, there aren't that many of those. Um, I'm just gonna, just fine. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so as you can say here, Ken, kin, sorry, kin levels uh, seem to be about the same. So you're as likely to name extra people who are kin as not kin. I'm going to click on this and see if that works. There we go. Um, they are less likely to be in the same household, just as likely to be in the same village, less likely to be in Agincourt, so in those 31 villages, and more likely to be in the rest of South Africa. I have to flag here also that this is a community where Migration for work is omnipresent. There's almost no employment locally aside from working on these, um, uh, basically on these tourist um, game um, reserves. So a lot of people will travel away for work, often quite long distances. So uh, that's quite possibly what's going on here. And if we look at whether or not it seems, to, it doesn't seem to have any, it doesn't seem that when you name those extra people, they are less connected or more, or indeed more connected to one another 
than before. So your ego net density doesn't seem to be changing radically. So I think I'm going to be okay on time. But um, the key findings here, and then I'll look at the comments and try and, and address them as well. Um, key findings, I think, from here is that once you limit the, the number of alters in the network, it does affect the composition. Uh, so alters named as the constraint is decreased. So you've got to flip these if you're thinking about constraining your alters more. Uh, tended to be in this in this population of older people living in rural South Africa, and we'll come back to that. They tend to be younger. They tend to be the same gender, and they tend to live further away. So you could, and I will say could, think about sons and daughters who are living in the city while you're living in the countryside. Um, they gave less financial and physical support, which if they are sons and daughters living in the city is perhaps unfortunate on the financial side. Um, and they generated less conflict, which, let me just get that right. Yes, which honestly was surprising given that we saw a lot more conflict in the network in general, right? But it, this is once we start to think about just the impact of the constraint, not the fact that over time, things will have changed as well. They seem to give just as much emotional and informational support as those core people you named when you only got to name two or three people, adding more seems to get more emotional informational support, and they're just as connected to other authors. I think one of my key, I think my key takeaway from this was that when we forced people to name six people, we didn't generate empty authors. We weren't generating people who were giving a bunch of names and then saying, I don't really talk to them. Like I, I bumped into them in the street last year, that's all. They did seem to push, once you pushed people and said, name all six, it did seem to generate people who had meaningful relationships with uh, the respondent. Um, I think there's obviously huge numbers of limitations in all this work, but the generalizability comes into it first, I think, is this going to be the case when you look at other settings? Um, second thing is, is it, a lo is it local to the number of alters you're forcing? So if you relax this to 10, would it look the same between 6 and 10 as it does between 2 and 6, for example? And obviously, we can stratify this analysis in many ways that I haven't yet found time to do. Um, but those are all things I'll look at later. I want to acknowledge and thank the co-authors on this work, uh, Elise, Nomsa, Stephen, and Lisa, the, the field team obviously at Halsey, who spent a lot of time collecting a lot of data, uh, study PIs, and the funders for this work.